Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Evo and Gary for their enormous trust through my processes. <laughs> um, if you are a performer or an artist, you know what kind of hustle it takes backstage to emerge on the stage looking like you're ready for it. Right? Um, and then I also want to extend a heartwarming regards to Winston in particular. Um, this is what I've done. The, the title of my paper, obviously, this is going to be less formal, so I will not be reading the paper. I will just be extracting what I've discovered in the process. But the title of the paper is Breakdowns and Breakthroughs, Empires Through Crisis and Transformation. Um, and I have just delivered this paper to Evo and Gary, hoping that they will give me their feedback. And if this ends up being distributed, um, then it will give you in more in-detail information. Uh, what I've done, I've, um, I said, as we attempt to assess the scope and the short-term and long-term consequences of today's multifaceted crisis, one quality point of entry into its problematics and convoluted paradoxes can be by taking a, um, a look into the historical rear view mirror so that we can be navigating the present um, and orienting ourselves properly. Uh, the metaphor is modern, but the, the you know, the, the problem and the idea of self-reflection and self-examination is, of course, old. What I've done in the process of reviewing huge chunks of historical um, periods, I've um, focused in particular on the decline of the Roman Empire and on the two world wars. To some extent, these are obvious critical points to be addressed. And in some other ways, there are understudied or misinterpreted parts of it that also should be looked at, even though, I mean, the research, the scholarly research is definitely is inconclusive about a lot of issues regarding um, these periods. One of the reasons, the things that motivated my research is, um, first of all, as discontinuously as I've taken them, as far apart chronologically they are, there's a method to my madness here, and um, that what I was looking at, I was trying to identify key factors that threw societies over the critical threshold and brought on cumulative turmoil. So pointing out to these two, um, they were dramatic with grand scale scope and long term influences um, that also caused devastating effects but also stirred a dramatic social change. Um, their decisive effects on the formation of the European West founded in the, on the institutional structures of Rome, as well as they were chosen for their respectively formative effect on the 20th and the 21st century. Um, as we have seen in the developments of 20th and 21st century, uh, we are we're seeing intensification of the traumatic on a grander and interestingly more frequent scale, because we're looking then less, you know, about 20 years between two world wars. Um, they can actually be seen as a single historical wave that they just came back one after another with in, in intensification of the exact same issues uh, being at play but on a grander scale and, and amplified. Um, so th these are the things that, <clears throat> that um, motivated my research and guided it to point out to what I do. I pretty much sketchingly go over these periods to extract the most, the patterns. So that will be in the paper. But one of the things I want to point out is that I approach this as we, it is in the title of the web seminar, through the social evolutionary lens. Which means that we are looking, this kind of approach is clearly more contrasted to the standard rational choice of paradigm. It has somewhat of, a, of an intuitive bent. It is all about um, learning. In, in, the, in, the, in the recognition of trials and errors in, as part of the evolutionary process of development. So it might actually see traumatic events as necessary part of such trials. And potentially it can, on the other hand of it, on the paradoxical side of it, it can actually relieve us individually and collectively of responsibility and accountability for a more conscious and conscientious development at the same time, by the same stroke. Nonetheless, it is a, say, less paralyzing and more dynamically positive approach that allows for the recovery of the spirit with which we believe in being able to steer, initiate, and realize changes. So that was the logic behind the, the our evolutionary um, approach. But then, 
to be true to another method, another part that I have included later in the paper, and I will talk about that in a minute, about continually keeping an eye on the correlations between inside and outside, macro and micro. I looked up um, a really interesting theory of, an, of a remarkable man, the founder, the father of, as the cliche goes, of the um, gifted education. He's a Polish psychologist, uh, and Dr. Zucconi would probably uh, recognize this person here and maybe give more insight to me. Um, this is the Polish psychologist called Kazimierz Dobrowski, who in the 70s formulated the theory of positive disintegration, considering personal crises as, and stresses and uh, uh, depressions and anxiety, as part of the creative process of in the development of personality. I'm just really roughly sketching and doing this. But I wanted, to, to, wanted to, to point out that there's a correlation on the macro and micro scale that between social evolutionary theory and this theory where personal developmental potential actually stages crisis marked by intense anxiety and depression. Um, they stage questioning of all values and former basis of identification, resulting in productive self-examination and self-reflection. Out of that comes the historical looking back in the rear view mirror, right? So personal transformations are possible, of course, only if the most immediate and vital personal concerns, such as being physical, such as basic physical survival are protected. So viewed through this lens, historical self-reflection of our social evolution is a necessary step in the redefinition as well as revitalization of the humanity. Analogies with Dabrowski's theory issue a critical warning to us as we address the global crisis. The bare minimum, now it's the bare minimum of our social transformation, rests on the vital precondition that our physical survivor cannot be threatened by devastation of natural resources in the nuclear or biological war. So I'm not going to go cover the historical period, but I'm going to go straight into summary of factors. And I'll be brief there so I can go into Another thing that I actually bring to this, um, what emerges here is a pattern of is um, unbridled expansion, aggressive military development, and several repeated factors that create societal tensions, eruptions, and breakdowns. Among them, the most prominent are uneven population growth and their demands among the rich and the poor, rapid development of urban centers, ever-increasing energy demands, environmental damage and depletion in the process, economic instabilities and the widening of wealth accumulation gaps, disenfranchising of certain population groups, and overextending of complex bureaucratic institutions. So I just want to point out real quickly, uh, quickly um, a work of, um, of a man, of a man, a scholar, uh, called Thomas Homer Dixon, and I found out that our own Michael Marion was um, a part of reviewing his work um, in his book called The Upside of Down. It's a wonderful name. I think you will appreciate the name of his book. Um, bear with me for one second. Um, it's The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization. He's relying on some other scholarly work, of course, but the bottom line is this. Um, the greater the complexity of a system, the less, less resilient it becomes. So this is where we're tracking the, imper the imperium-like or the empire-like overextension over geography and extension of the systems of governing, uh, trade, uh, communication that are gluttonously then drawing on resources, um, ever increasing uh, um, hunger for resources. So I'm just, I just really sort of crudely um, did this for you, just sum it, sum it up. So some of the things that I, that I would like to uh, um, point out to in the aftermath and outcomes of these big um, um, empires and big movements, big alli alliances, um, what we see is, as we look over the general historical period, ancient, classical, and modern, and the development of empires within those economic, uh, economic, political revolutions, 
agricultural, industrial, and modern global communication, we see the increase in the speed and the scale of the net development, as well as the increase of connectivity among systems and people. So there is a paradox. Connectivity can both be beneficial and detrimental at the same time. It can help educate, engage, and mobilize with unprecedented speed, and yet it can facilitate the panic-inducing spread of fear and disaster and the catastrophic wave-like um, uh, spreading of, of any trauma or any disaster. Uh, most noticeably, empires have the greatest unifying and the greatest destructive capacity. Post-World War uh, II, we saw a great actualization, pun intended, of the imperial territories and the stunning fear of potential human erasure. But we also saw envisioning of a greater unification through the formation of the United Nations. <clears throat> Even though many will say, with uneven voting weight, but it's still there. The Great Depression brought the reform of American capitalism by Roosevelt, and again, many will say, obviously, need more reform. Military-driven inventions spurred by the power competition during the World Wars and the Cold War era spread into everyday consumption and usage by the greater number of civilians. The period engendered a great integration of the other half of humanity, women, into the public sphere as econopolitical subjects. In fact, kind of forced the integration of women. My question here is, how do we demilitarize our invention? Um, it appears that our challenge is to reclaim, appropriate, and transform the power of structures already in place, not to overthrow them, but to work from within. On, on the one hand, and then to unhinge the consequential relationship between the militaristic motivation for invention and their general benefit. In other words, our challenge is to envision types and modes of expansion and human unification without the detrimental effects and the damage control in the aftermath of crisis that those advancements usually cause, and of course, without the totalitarian goal, even as we have to, we are forced to um, look at things in totality and work in totality, in unification. Um, um, let me see. One of the things that, um, what I was saying, what these critical times addressed earlier directed us to reevaluate the place and effects of evolution versus revolution, as well as the question of charismatic figures of great leaders as the power of the greater, in, in the power of the greater public. I mean, who are the leaders and who, what is the power based on and who has the power? Noam Chomsky repeatedly points out that after the Cold War, the only counterbalancing force is the public. And then we'll have to ask, who is the public? I'll get back to that real, real quickly. But as, as a bare minimum, the coalescing of multiple stresses needs to be diffused so that, so that their cumulative eroding effect is alleviated. And that's, the, that's another theory that says that if we keep these issues at a very peaking momentum, we will, we will avoid all of them coalescing in the same way, in the collapsing way. That's something else to, to think about. So um, what I'm going to bring to this, I'm just going to mention another person, which I think his work is fantastic, who actually works on human ecology economics. His name is Roy E. Allen. And he talks about four particular quadrants of human ecology, human populations, belief systems, social agreements, and physical environment and resources. Any organization and any institution has to function on the intersection of those. Um, what I looked at and what I've discovered, I think, I hope I have a minute to just present this. What I've discovered is a, a, a set of key systemic features, and I already heard that repeated through Evo's speech and Gary's speech. And they are correlations of correspondences, relationships, paradoxes, and continuums. Um, to be as, and they're all, of course, interrelated, but Addressing any critical issue today, we need to take into account its multifaceted relationship to other aspects of our human condition. So we'll have to take into account these specific systematic features in order to derive any kind of solution. And in terms of correlation, there is the distinctions between inside and outside and macro and micro have to be dramatically rethought. So one example is the, the, the issue of trash. And now that we have 
severe issue of stage junk that actually multiplies, um, there is no outside and inside. Throwing a bottle out of your car doesn't mean that it's outside of your personal environment anymore, whether that's dumped in another underdeveloped country or your own apartment. This is a pressing and daunting issue that will teach us better what is inside outside. In correlation with macro and micro, we need to also mention or ask, um, you know, the value of there are no small perspectives, there are no small places anymore, and the depletion of natural resources is tightly correlated to the depletion of human spirit and the epidemics of depression, medicated and things like that. And let's just for a second go back to Dabrowski, who I'm sure would be terrified of looking at many children who have been um, massively um, medicated for their hyperactivity, which is one of the gifted um, features. So in terms of paradoxes, this is something that we've all latched onto. We really need to look at the um, liberatory promises of capitalism and democracy, and especially the relationship of embeddedness of the two. That, that's a particularly complex situation, that they have to be unhinged somehow and reconstituted in a healthier fashion, obviously. The paradox of the capitalism tenets of progress, productivity, competition, we're not going to throw them out. However, we have to realize their paradoxical nation that they self-perpetuate scarcity, insecurity, and lack. So they are preempting the same promises, their own pro its own promises to be preserved as promises always on the ever receding horizon of fulfillment. Greater security, um, we're investing so much before your child is born, you are told you need to be saving for their college funds, which are swiped away in one financial crash. Uh, mega insurance, uh, you know, uh, while we are alerted to start saving uh, at the same time, you know, we have the aleatory nature of our market economy. On and on and on. Many, many, um, in terms of relationships, um, they are, no, they're, sorry, uh, um, in terms of, I'll just mention these two things. In terms of relationships, um, you know, here's, here's something we need to look at. Uh, there has to be established relationships between issues methods as well as agents of change. So if I hear a very influential banker tell me at a conference saying I'm a banker and I'm, an, I'm not an altruist, um, I have to think about it as this saying that you are not related to anybody else, even though as a, as a banker you're managing actually relationships. So on a continuum, long-term, uh, short-term effects, uh, spatial contraction of our globe through transportation and communication, on and on. What is, what is important to me here is to, to, to point this thing out, um, because I'm talking about pairs, and maybe that will be conclusion, I'll leave it at that. Slavoj Žižek said at one point that it used to be, the world used to say we need the United States. This is tied into world, war, world wars and everything. Now the United States needs people, needs us, and the rest of the world, okay? And there's something that needs to be said about that, in particular about the fact that promoting and using natural generation of grabbing in Africa and Latin America. We have to rescue those same structures to preserve them, in fact, to preserve the empire in order to be able to transform it from within, in actually in neutrality to avoid collapse, rather than assume that we can possibly make a more radical change. So it seems that the evolutionary approach uh, could be that thing. In terms of prioritizing, I'll, I'll just use one example, there are tons of them. In terms of all of these things, and on the basis of what's happening in the U.S., the debate over gay marriage has taken so much collective energy that if we thought about really relationships, paradoxes, and all of those things on the, on the scale of our unified mission of saving humanity, they would have no meaning. In fact, we would find all those people maybe helping because the basis of that argument is that the marriage should be um, reproductively based. Maybe they will help, um, you know, reducing our population. <laughs> that was a tongue-in-cheek comment, but in reality, it's very real comment. And maybe that's the way to okay. mobilize the other camp. Thank you. <laughs>